Seven Marketing Tips for Your Restaurant 2022. I'm James Ealing. This is Secret Source, the restaurant marketing podcast. Today, we're going to be looking at ways that you can increase the profitability of your restaurant with a few simple marketing ideas that we're seeing working in restaurants around the world. Some restaurants are quiet, lose money, and the owner works 70 hours a week. Other restaurants are busy, profitable, and the owners work a few hours a day. What's the difference? They have a secret sauce. Join James from Marketing for Restaurants as he helps you come up with your recipe for restaurant success. Your secret sauce. Hey everyone, welcome back to the podcast. This is part two, so if you've missed part one, make sure you go back and have a listen to it. We covered off on some really important things that you need to be thinking about in running your restaurant, and that is because everything's changed. Since 2020, uh, customers have changed, running a business has changed, costs have changed, technology's changed, everything's changed, and you need to change along with it, otherwise you're going to go out of business. Last week, we looked at Know Your Customer, Tell a Story, and Cost Your Menu. So, And we spent a bit of time on each one of those, why it's really important, what's changed, and what it is that you need to be thinking about uh, so that you're going to be able to increase the profitability of your restaurant. And it's not all about profitability, but the whole thing is that many of the problems that you've got in running a restaurant are a lot easier to deal with if you're profitable, if you're really profitable. And on top of that, it's going to help you achieve your the goals that you've set for yourself at a personal level, not just at a business level. I think that's really important. You know, things like taking a holiday, being able to invest, doing, you know, having a little bit of flexibility, a little bit of security in your life, rather than just going month to month, week to week, even for some restaurants, struggling to pay the landlord, pay the invoices for all of your costs, pay wages. This week, we've got another, uh, we've got a few more things that we're going to look at. The first one that I want everyone to be thinking about is have a look at the niches that you're targeting. Are you targeting any? Now, when we go back to know your customer, you want to have a series of avatars. So if I was running a restaurant, you know, there'd be a few things that I would be looking at. What are the food specific niches that I'd be targeting? Am I going to be looking for vegetarians? Am I not going to cater for vegetarians? Am I going to be a meat-only restaurant? Uh, Once again, these are the kind of things that can really feed into your story that you're going to have for your customers, which is going to increase brand affinity, which means that you can charge more, which helps out with a lot of problems. Gluten-free, is that going to be something that you're going to be looking at? And we've talked a lot about gluten-free because I think it's a really powerful niche Not many people go for it. There's a lot of people who are looking for gluten-free food. And it's just one of those ways that you can have a unique selling proposition that is going to resonate with a lot of people, that is going to create a lot of repeat customers for you. And it's not all that difficult to be able to go after. Vegetarian, flexitarian, they're also really big niches that you can go for. Local paddock to plate. That's something that a lot of people are looking at, you know, starting to tell the stories of where your meat is coming from. Why do you buy it from there? Your seafood, is it sustainable? They're things that customers are starting to look for. And when you present that niche to people who are interested in it, it can really resonate with them. And so what we'll often do with a customer is that we will run a vegetarian campaign specifically targeting vegetarians in the area. It'll drive them to a vegetarian landing page and that way vegetarians who are looking for a meal, potentially just vegetarians looking for a meal, but but also vegetarians looking for a meal of that cuisine. They're interested in it. They see it. It's like, yes, I'm vegetarian. Let me click on the link. They go to a dedicated landing page. That dedicated landing page has got two or three hero dishes that are super yummy and look good. There's big photos there. And they're like, I'm going to go there. That sounds really good. And if you can deliver If you can deliver great food, great value, great experiences, then they're really likely to come back. Because if you are a vegetarian, there's probably not that many vegetarian restaurants in your area. It's a lot less than all of the restaurants. So powerful to be thinking about niches and how you're going to tell a niche story. I've worked with restaurants where they actively target six specific niches. And you know what? 
like the big thing is that none of them are amazing. None of them are that powerful that you go, you know, we are just, we're able to target just this one. But when you've got six different types of people within the geographic area of your restaurant who all come to your restaurant and they come to the restaurant for a different reason, that can be really powerful, particularly when you're looking at finding new customers and turning them into repeat customers. Okay, now the number one, two, and three problem for most restaurant owners today is staffing. Getting staffing, retaining staffing, not having to pay them a wage that is completely unrealistic because there's literally no staff to be had. And so one of the things that I think is really cool, and now it doesn't work for everyone, but it can work for some people really, really powerfully, is marketing for staff. So actually running ads about your restaurant and why people would want to work in there. And just as we have USPs for the team, there are restaurants that have a USP about why people would want to work for them. And I think you can be really, really clever in the way that you can structure your team, structure your roster in a way where you don't have blank spots, where you're not forced to close on some days. So some restaurants are closing because they don't have the staff to be able to be open seven days a week. Now, what does that do for your restaurant? Well, it does a couple of things. The big thing is that all of your fixed costs, so the big one there would be your lease, those fixed costs are now going to be spread over less hours each month. So just uh, some very quick numbers here. If you're paying $10,000 a month for your lease and you're open seven days a week, then it's costing you $41 an hour just for your lease. Now, you've got all of your other fixed costs that you're going to add in there, So, but just bear with me on this one. If you can't get the staff to be open seven days a week, then what a lot of people will do is they'll drop their two least profitable days, and so they'll go to five days a week. Now, that increases their per hour lease to $56 an hour because you're not open as many hours. You don't have as many hours to spread that cost over. Now, $41 to $56 doesn't sound like that much. Well, surprise, it's actually a 36% increase in your leasing costs. That's going to hurt. You know, you're going to be wanting to keep your your lease costs ideally less than 10%, uh, super ideally less than 8%. Your leasing costs have just gone up by 36%. So you're going to have to be peddling a lot more to be able to meet those costs. Uh Uh-oh, your revenue is going to go down because you're only open for five days, not seven. So automatically, even if you've dropped the two least profitable days of the week, you're still going to see a big decrease in revenue. So that can be really quite a death knell for the profitability of any restaurant. So getting the staff, retaining the staff, really, really important. The number one thing is to have a reason why people would want to work there. Start thinking about the value proposition that you've got. I know restaurants that are focusing on, they're trying to break down their roster into a whole series of micro segments. So who's going to open for breakfast? And let's just target them, get them to come in for a short shift. Maybe you'll you'll close. If you're not doing good trade for the morning tea, maybe you'll close. Maybe you're going to target the mums and dads with kids who they have to drop off at school and so create a shift where they can start at like 9.30 or 10 o'clock in the morning and then they can go through and do your lunch and your early afternoon. Who's going to be working dinner? Are you open for dinner? Well, who are the people that are available who can earn a few extra dollars by coming in and working an evening shift? Then getting that message out to people. And if your restaurant, if you had a strong vegetarian component or vegan component, You can market to vegans because that's the kind of restaurant that they're going to want to work in. If you've got a message about how we want to, we want to introduce people to the vegan way of life. We want by, by creating amazing tasting vegan meals. And we would like people to think more about having less meat in their diet, in their life. That is the kind of restaurant where vegans are going to be. I would like to work there. That is a mission that I can relate to. And I would like to help out with that mission. So more likely to get people to work there, more likely to retain them because your mission aligns with their mission and create, and it's a lot easier to do that when you've already got some similarity. A lot of people will run their business where they're going to create alignment between personal visions and business visions where there isn't that great alignment. Now, you can do that and that's what great leaders do. They get people excited about the vision of the organization. But if you can find people out there who've already got a vision, which is really close to yours, then 
it's a lot easier to attract them and retain them. But even if you don't have that, just going out into the marketplace, running a Facebook ad and saying, you know, yep, this is what we do. We've got lots of shift flexibility. You know, try and think, you know, great team. What are the perks of working in the job? You know, and I know places where, you know, the family will be able to come in once a week for a meal or all of those little things. They're the things that can make people go, you know what? I will do that. I will try and work there. We are in a high inflationary environment. So there are people who are looking for that second, third, and tragically even fourth job to be able to continue to meet the financial needs of their family. So a little bit of flexibility there is going to enable you to attract stuff. And I think it's really, really important. You don't want to be the restaurant that will hire someone after they just check the pulse. Is this person alive? Yes, you've got the job. Build a team because you're going to interview people. That's time out of your day. That's really expensive. You should be putting a high value on your time because you don't have a lot of it. So if you're going to interview people, you need to be accounting for the time that you're going to be spending interviewing. You want a decent interview process. Otherwise, you'll potentially let in axe wielding homicidal maniacs. And we all know the negative effect that they have on your team. So you want to try and rule those people out all of the um, the negative Nellies, all of the people that you really don't want, you know, they're, they're working for their 10th restaurant this year. They're not the people you want to be hiring. You want to find and identify the really good people. When they come in, you're then going to be hiring them. Even if they're really experienced in front of house, you still got to, you'll have your way of doing things and you'll be training them to do that. So there's a cost involved with that. That's why retaining staff is really, really important. Now, one thing that I think is really important is just making sure that you take the time out of your day to sit down and have a chat, not while they're on the floor, get her to sit down. How's everything going? Are there any issues? Is there anything that we can do to help? Are you having fun? You know, whatever that is, those questions. I'm a big believer in it. It's something that we do in our company. I think it creates a huge amount of value. The staff love it. I love getting the feedback about the areas that we can improve to be an employer of choice. But definitely think about putting that out there because I know... A lot of people, they'll just use a, uh, a recruiting firm. They may put it up on Facebook and but not run an ad to it. And you've got to remember, Facebook is pay to play. So if you're not running an ad, then you're really going to struggle. And if they do, they're just targeting you know people all over the place. So people from a long way away, they're not going to travel to work in your restaurant. They're not specific about it. If you're targeting everyone, then your message is going to be really weak. If you're going to target parents of school-age kids, then you can say, hey, do you want to earn some extra money during the middle of the day in between school pickup and drop-off? That message is a lot more targeted and is much more likely to work because you're going to put that in front of people who are dropping kids off and picking them up from school. So definitely have a think about that. Can you increase the profitability of your restaurant? Because you may, like if you're getting in contract staff, that's going to cost a fortune. If you're really, really struggling, the last thing that you want to be doing is paying well and truly above what everyone else is paying. You want to have a great place to work where you can pay a fair wage to your team. That's what I think. Now, the next one, uh, so, you know, this is the kind of thing that you would expect me to say, uh, review your website. Now, so sad story. If you've listened to the podcast at all, you know that I love Indian food and you'll know that predominantly we get our Indian food from the same restaurant and we get it on Friday night. And I always get a chicken vindaloo. Like our order, we just repeat order time and time and time again. We get the same thing. Very traditional, conservative in our in our online ordering. Tragedy, crisis, they close down. Now, to be honest, I'm not surprised. So the food that they cook there is great. There's a few Indian restaurants around us. We're not sure where we're going to go. And f- to be honest, we haven't had Indian food since they closed down. They closed down probably about six weeks ago. They were on, you know, a couple of the online delivery company websites, but they also had their own online ordering system. Well, they had Frollo, the free restaurant online ordering system. I was introduced to them because they signed up and I thought, oh, they deliver to our area. We'll we'll try them. Now, we spent a fortune with them because we we would normally buy two meals because, you know, Indian food, unlike Chinese, Indian food actually gets better. So even if it's five days old, the food gets better. I know the Vindaloo tastes is a lot hotter after it's been a few days in the fridge. So we would order a couple of meals. So it was usually, we were quite a big orderer and we did it. It was our default setting. So two or three times a month we were ordering it. And we'd been a customer of theirs for probably 
well, for over three years. So we spent quite a lot of money with them. The online ordering system was not that popular. So they got a lot less people ordering from it. Now, and of course, it's our online ordering system. So I was like, kind of, oh, this is not good. Now, I didn't do the ordering. My wife did the ordering. So I said to her, you know, what's the go? And she said, well, their website's awful. And I said, yeah, but yeah, but they should still be getting people. And she goes, no, 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 they've got massive problems with it. And so on a laptop, they would have a thing that said order here, but that icon didn't actually show on a full screen resolution. What you had to do is you had to change the size of the window so that it was more portraity style. And then the Frollo button would appear. (sighs) Now I'd told them on multiple occasions and I'd actually offered to get one of our developers to fix their website. And they're like, oh no, we've got a web developer, but he never fixed it. So as a consequence, their conversion rate for their online ordering system uh, struggled massively. I suspect that if they'd found, we ordered quite a lot from, like I think that we were super loyal. If they'd found 10 more customers who ordered as much as us, it would have made a material difference to the profitability of their restaurant. We're talking thousands and thousands of dollars if they'd gotten those customers that were ordering as frequently as us. On an annual basis, it would have been not small bickies. They never did that. Now, on top of that, the rest of the website was awful. There were stock photos. It was all over the place. There were spelling mistakes. The menu was difficult to find. A whole number of reasons. There was no SEO. There was no integration with the Facebook Pixel. A hundred, they they didn't tell a story. It was just a stock templated, ordinary looking website, which even if I said to you, oh, you've got to try this restaurant. It's my favorite restaurant. I order from them all the time. Even that you would have gone, oh, what's James talking about? This looks awful. The sad reality of it is that today in 2022, there are a lot of restaurants. They were probably in the bottom 20%. But there are a lot of restaurants out there who are leaving a lot of customers on the table because their website doesn't tell their story. It doesn't talk about the niches that they target. It doesn't, you know, tell a convincing story about why you would want to work there. It doesn't represent the food that is created in a great way. There's no amazing photos. There's no SEO for all of those things that we've talked about. They don't rank well. And so I think that at the heart of it is that most people will go to someone and say, I want a website. Now, we build websites. I don't like building websites. I don't like websites. I think they're annoying. They're a security risk. They always need to be maintained. Blah, 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 blah. It's, they're annoying. Life would be better if you didn't have websites. But it's not about getting a website. It's about getting a way that works 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year, that is going out and putting your restaurant forward in front of people who may or may never have heard of your restaurant and who may or may not want the food that you create. That's what you need. You need to be KPIing your website for the number of visits that you get. If you're getting like 50 visits, unless you're in a really, really country town, That's not great. And you know what? If you're in a country town that small, everyone's going to know about your restaurant anyway. They've probably all tried it. And if they're not all regular customers, then there's something wrong with your business plan or or something wrong in the kitchen. There's got to be something wrong there. Many restaurants are getting a thousand or thousands of customers, potential customers going to their website every month. Now, if you've got any questions, you can always reach out to us and one of our team can, you know, give you a call and say, you know, these are the issues with your website. I'm super passionate about helping restaurant owners be profitable because I know this is the hardest industry out there. But if your website is not helping you, then, because this is the thing that I think is really scary about it, is that you can go to Google Analytics and you get a report about how many people went to your website. It doesn't give you a report on how many people didn't go to your website. So how many people were looking for an Indian restaurant near me? How many people were looking for best degustation menu? How many people were looking for best pizza, best hamburger, best whatever it is that you cook and went somewhere else? Because someone had put the time and effort in to have great SEO. And then great SEO, that'll get the customer there. A couple of great photos of the food. Yep, I'm really hungry. This is where I'm going to eat. And then... If you deliver that great food, great value, great experience, boom, you just got yourself another repeat customer. 
And then you start looking at the restaurant loyalty graph. How many of those customers have been back twice, three times, five times, 10 times, 20 times? If you've got a customer who's come back 20 times, just think how much money they've spent with you. How many of those have you got? How many often are they coming in? That's the backbone of many a profitable restaurant. People aren't tracking it. People aren't doing enough to get that happening in their in their restaurant. So really do have a look at your, at your website. A lot of the changes, if you've got a web developer, a lot of the changes you should be able to get done. Sometimes it's easy to get started, to start completely fresh with a new website, particularly a company like ours that specializes in restaurant websites because we know all of the tricks. We don't do accounting websites or any of that other stuff. We just do restaurant websites, which makes it really easy to know all of the tricks that work. Because we're really metric focused, we, we're looking at that on a monthly basis. Which customers are going up? Which customers are going down? What is it that we can do to improve that? So number seven, now it's 2022, a lot of things have changed. You must, you must optimize your delivery or takeout business. So the proportion of restaurants who are now doing takeout and or delivery has increased massively. The big issue with this is that many restaurants have not really taken the time to sit back and think about where does this fit in our strategy? Where does it fit in the business strategy? Where does it fit in the marketing strategy? If you're going to deliver food, it opens up a whole lot of new customers or potential customers that you can be servicing. If you're going to do takeout, it uh, means that you're now no longer limited to the number of tables that you've got. And once again, people who want to eat in their home, but are prepared to come and pick it up. Now, they're two really interesting niches or use cases for your product that people were forced to think about because of COVID and stay-at-home orders. But things are getting a little bit interesting now because there's very few stay-at-home orders, but there's a couple of dramas. So it's really hard to find people to work in a restaurant. Guess what? It's actually a lot harder for companies like Uber and Menulog and Just Eat to find people to do their deliveries. They were the employer of last resort. I would argue they probably still are. There's a whole heap of issues with being employed by Uber or Just Eat. That means that a lot of those people who were working for them, they've now gone out and got a job in another industry where they're short of staff and they're prepared to take on that training burden. So it's very hard to get people. This means that the service delivery for many of these delivery companies has fallen apart. I'm really passionate about people sorting out their delivery strategy because (laughs) I suffer from it. On multiple occasions, we've there's a restaurant that we like. Now, this was less of a drama because we were often ordering from the Indian restaurant and they had their own drivers. So, you know, we knew the drivers. They were nice. They were friendly. And we knew that everything was going to be good. However, every now and then we would order from another restaurant and generally that would be off a platform because there aren't that many restaurants who are taking orders themselves and delivering it which is a little bit crazy because all of the pizza restaurants do it. So they've proven that you can actually do it profitably. They've been delivering pizza profitably for 60 years. For some reason, a lot of other restaurants can't work out. I know it's it creates a big logistics problem, but re- pizza restaurants have been doing it profitably for 60 years. So I think this is something that people need to be thinking about. Our Indian restaurant was doing it profitably and we love them for it. There's some restaurants that we like and... Either they've struggled with, they'll be on and off again with Uber or Menulog. Often when they do it, there's problems in getting a driver. So I know that on one occasion, we ordered a a sushi platter, which sounded pretty exciting. It's a restaurant that we'd eaten at before. We knew that their food was amazing. We were super excited to be getting a platter from them. They couldn't get anyone to deliver it. So all of that food probably went in the bin. Now, I think that's a really big tragedy. And on top of that, we had no food. We had to go and order from someone else. We ended up eating like at 9.30 at night and we were super hungry. So if they'd had their own delivery staff, would have come out a lot quicker. They wouldn't have been that food waste. I know that we've had, we ordered from Uber only a few months ago and can't remember what cuisine it was, but I do know that we didn't even get that cuisine wrong restaurant, wrong cuisine. And tragically, we'd ordered quite a bit of food and we got about half the food that we were expecting because whoever got our food, they were well fed, we weren't. So there's quality control issues in there. There's food hygiene issues as well. 
with deliveries that can take forever to be delivered because the the drivers are picking up three or four different meals at once and then delivering them, which means that it might be sitting in the back of a car for an extended period of time. But the big thing is the profitability for the restaurant. The delivery companies take a fortune, an absolute fortune, and you need to be thinking about that. You need to be trying to work out a way of providing delivery in a profitable manner. The Indian restaurant that we were using, it was the same price whether you ordered in or or out, and they just had a small delivery fee. From memory, I think it was seven dollars fifty, and that was profitable for them. They loved it. They said that, that you know it was good getting those deliveries because they only delivered for a short area, a short period of time, and they were making good money on the meals. Have a think about the profitability. Have a think about, you know, could you deliver it yourself? Could you go to pick up only? So we've done that. When there's a restaurant that's got food that we think is amazing, we will go and pick it up because we know, A, it's going to be a little bit cheaper. And so sometimes we are prepared to go out. Sometimes we're too lazy and we'll say, no, screw it. We want someone to bring it to us. But if you don't want to go to the hassle of having your own delivery team, then do pick up. You know, that takeout business can be really powerful. And it means that you're not blocked with the number of people that you can get in, depending on the number of tables. So you're not trying to harass people to get out quickly so you can turn the tables more often. Have a think about the items that you're going to have on there. My pet hate is, you know, hamburger rush restaurants that will, they'll have their entire menu there. And it's like, you know what? Hamburgers don't actually travel too well. Have a think about the way that you do that. Have a think about the packaging. Lots of innovation there still to become. I think in Australia, they're a long way behind uh, in the United States. Delivery is a lot slicker. Delivery packaging, delivery concepts, delivery food, the products, a lot more thought goes into that, a lot more advanced. Here, not a lot of innovation. People are just saying, well, this is my menu. This is what it looks like when I put it in a tub. And by the time it gets to the customer, often not too appealing, which is really quite sad. Now, uh, that was the seventh idea that we had. So we've covered uh, niches, marketing for staff, review your website, optimize your delivery and takeout business. I do have one more because we always like to under-promise and over-deliver, and that is do some marketing. (laughs) I talk to restaurant owners, and this always gets me. It's like, you know, so what's not working in the marketing? Oh, well, we're not actually doing a lot of marketing. Right. So you don't have enough people coming into the restaurant, but you're not doing any marketing. No. Now, it's 2022. It's never been easier for a restaurant to be able to run their own ads. It's never been easier for a restaurant to engage with a company like us. We can set up campaigns for you. All you've got to do is do the post and that campaign will continue on. You don't have to be an expert in Facebook marketing to be able to run campaigns. It's never been easier to get us to do all of that. There's plenty of options out there. But if you're doing all of those other things, then you re- you still run the risk of having the best restaurant that no one's ever heard of. And this kills a lot of restaurants. A lot of people think that marketing is a little bit of an admission that the food's not that great. I've got to tell you, There are so many restaurants out there that do an amazing job of service, an amazing job in the kitchen. They produce food that is to die for, but the restaurant dies. And that's because they've got the best restaurant that no one's ever heard about. There are people out there who are pretty ordinary in the kitchen. They're pretty ordinary uh, front of house. The experiences that they create are not great, but they really, really slick with the marketing and that works really well for them. And it's the sad reality of it is that a an average or at least, it's easy with a good restaurant, a good restaurant with great marketing will be much more profitable than a an amazing restaurant with no marketing. Now, everyone's always going to say, oh yeah, but I know this one restaurant and they're always booked out and they don't do no marketing. The first thing is, well, they're probably... I know restaurants that don't, they're they're very big on, we don't do any marketing, but they've got two full-time people in their PR team, or they're, you know, one of the top 100 restaurants in the world. You know, those people don't need to do marketing, and I think they actually have a competition to see who can have the worst website, because they don't need one, because people are going to come to them anyway. For everyone else, you need to be doing some marketing. You need, there is a fight for all of those customers, for all of the meals, for the breakfast, lunch, dinner, 
dessert, all of those things that, that restaurants offer, it's a knife fight. And there are people out there who are just slowly chipping away and they are finding, you know, every week they're finding five or six people who want to come into their restaurant. And not all of those people are going to become repeat customers, but some of them do. And over time, they run quite successful businesses. And then they start to reach capacity limits, which means they can start putting their prices up. And that's when the profitability really kicks in. I think it's important because you want to be thinking about if you're the restaurant owner, you want to be thinking about what your personal plan is. You don't want to have a job. You don't want to be working insane hours for uh, a wage that is less than someone who's working front of house. You've got to be putting some money aside. So work out what, what success looks like with you running a restaurant. You know, some of the best work that I've done has been talking to restaurant owners and just saying, you know what, if, if I was you, I would, I would close the business down. You know, you've got so many challenges. You're not doing well. You know, what about your mental health? What about your family life? What about all of those things? And people have said, you know what, oh, that's what I'm going to do. And they've been really happy afterwards. It's not for everyone. It's a full contact sport. So what does success look like for that? Then what kind of business plan is it that's going to make that success? Now, if you want to travel back to your home country once a year and it's going to cost you $15,000 to do that, you need a business that's going to pay your wage, pay an equitable wage for you for all of the hours that you put in it. And on top of that, you want to be able to take out $15,000 to be able to go on a holiday after you've allocated some for reinvestment in the business. That's what you need to be focusing on. That's what that business plan needs to drive. Then underneath your business plan, you've got to have a marketing plan that is going to drive the number of people in, spending the amount of money with the appropriate profit margin so that you're able to generate that much profit. Too many people don't think like that. Too many people are trying to get some sort of result where one of those formulas, one of those plans is fundamentally broken. But I've got to tell you, if you're not actually doing some marketing, if you don't have a marketing plan, what's on the calendar? What's coming up next? What's the next holiday? What's the next opportunity? Is, is Valentine's Day just around the corner? Is that something that you should be targeting? Having a think about that, trying to get ahead of the curve, trying to do a little bit of proactive marketing can make a huge difference. And we see that with you know Facebook campaigns that we're running or a website that goes from you know getting 250 visits a month. Over a 12-month period, they're getting 1,000 visits. That kind of change, that certainly makes a difference in the turnover and it certainly makes a difference in the profitability of the restaurant. And for some of our customers, it's a difference between lack of profitability and profitability. That's pretty exciting. So yes, definitely have a think about that. Have a think about the marketing that you're going to do. If you're struggling with it, well, you know what? There's 164 podcasts before this one where we cover a lot of marketing ideas. Failing that, reach out and have a chat to us. We love helping restaurants find new customers and turn them into repeat customers. So that's about it. Y'all have a really busy week. And if it is really busy, make sure it's profitable. That's about it. See ya. Want more customers for your restaurant, cafe or takeout? Every month, our marketing tools and information are used by thousands of restaurant owners just like you to help them find more customers and turn them into repeat customers. All of our tools and information is designed specifically for restaurant owners. We know you don't have a lot of time to spend marketing or learning complicated procedures, so our tools are quick and easy to use. If you're looking to increase your revenue and profits or want to work less hours, check out marketingforrestaurants.com.